I'm a bit of a stranger in a strange land, but I've tried to adapt and go to lots of sessions uh, to learn your world. And my Fitbit tells me that I've been too stationary while I've been here, uh, so I want to get to know the audience a little bit better before I start. Uh, I'll do the first bit with show of hands, but then we're going to do some standing up. How many of you know what formal privacy or differential privacy is? Just a show of hands. Looks like a, a smattering, uh, more, than, more than I would get at, a, at an economics event of similar magnitude. Uh, now we'll go to the active uh, participation. How many of you have ever interacted with a differentially private data collection system? Just stand up if you have. Ilya Mironov just stand, stood up. All right, stay standing. How many of you use the Chrome browser? Stand up if you use the Chrome browser. How many of you have an iPhone running iOS 10 or 11? Stand up if you have such a device. How many of you have a mobile device running uh, Windows 10? Stand up if you have such a device. No, no, stay standing. I, I want cumulative stand up. If you answered any of those questions, yes, you should be vertical and getting some Fitbit credit for going up and down. All of you have interacted with a differentially private data collection system, and I'll show you some of the properties of that one while I talk about the one we're implementing for the US Census. You can sit down now. Thanks very much. Uh, usually, I blow through the, uh, the acknowledgments and disclaimer slide, but I don't want to do that today because I want to draw your attention to a few members of the team that are working with me. Uh, Dan Kiefer, who worked for the Census Bureau for about a year when he was on sabbatical leave for Penn State, is the scientific lead for the system I'm going to describe today. A lot of the ideas he conceptualized. Simpson Garfinkel, whom I hired from NIST to work for the Census Bureau, is the senior scientist for confidentiality and data access, and he's engineering the implementation, including the framework. Um, Tammy Adams did the reconstruction uh, programming that I'm going to talk about. Uh, Ashwin Machanabahala, Dan Kiefer, and I have collaborated for years on differentially private implementations for the U.S. Census Bureau. Ashwin's active, as are uh, Jerome Micklau and uh, Michael Hay. These names are computer scientists who may be known to you. Most of the other names on there are mathematical statisticians who work at the Census Bureau. All right, so let me give you a very short history of differential privacy at the U.S. Census Bureau. This is the article that was launched with a collaboration with Johannes Gerke, Ashwin Machanavahala when he was a PhD student at Cornell, it was when Johannes was still at Cornell, um, and Dan Kiefer when he was a postdoc at Cornell. Lars Vilhuber is uh, uh, an associate of mine and another research economist also at Cornell. We spent 2008 with Johannes and Ashwin and Dan teaching me data privacy theory, and Lars and I continuously teaching them the theorem that we needed to have proved as opposed to the theorem that they could prove. And this is always at the heart of collaborations between, uh, we call people like me at the Census Bureau SMEs, subject matter experts, and computer scientists who are, uh, who are experts in the, in the algorithmic domain. In 2008, we published a method for protecting uh, residential data that could be directly implemented on a product at the Census Bureau. This is that product. We call it on the map, all run together. So if you uh, Google search sitecensus.gov, on the map, all run together, you'll get that. Or if you take my slides later and you click there, you'll get the current version of the application. But the differential privacy protections were implemented in 2008. So that was worldwide the first production implementation of a formally private uh, confidentiality protection system. And that system is still running. Indeed, the FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, uses a version of this system to figure out the risks associated with current fires in California. There's hurricane uh, that's now active on that system. So the privacy protections are being used in real time uh, to assist in uh, emergency management, among many other things. This is a picture of sort of what we were look, working on when we imagined this implementation. Uh, this is Ithaca, New York, where I used to live. The orange boundary is the city of Ithaca. And this shows the commute distance and direction 
for everyone that the database thinks works in the city of Ithaca where they live. Uh, the, the, the workplace data were protected by an earlier version, although Ashwin and his student Sam Haney have collaborated with us to put differential privacy to the workplace data. But the, the residential data here are all protected by differential privacy. So those, those dots that you see are graphed from synthetic data that have been sampled from a formerly private uh, system and then plotted. So that's the 2018 implementation. My point here is that the Census Bureau has gotten to differential privacy by a legitimate concern for protecting the confidentiality of the respondent information that we are supplied. Indeed, the statute that governs our conduct of the Census of Population and Housing has a dual mandate. The mandate says that we have to provide useful statistics. In the case of the census, it says we have to provide 51 numbers that reapportion the House of Representatives and then detailed data by statute to redraw every legislative district. This is a presentation done by our CIO at a recent 2020 program management review. That's a, every quarter a public accounting for how we're running the 2020 census. And it was about data stewardship in general, but you can see that we announced officially that we would be protecting the end product of our 2020 census with differential privacy. So that will be the first large scale production implementation of a central differential privacy system worldwide. We're going to use it to protect all of the publications from the 2020 census. Why? All right, I think I'm now gonna wander into a lot more familiar territory for most of you. In 2003, two cryptographers, Irit Diner and Kobe Nassim, wandered in to the data publication space. And they proved a theorem that we call in my line of work, the database reconstruction theorem. And what did that theorem say? It said, too many statistics published too accurately from a confidential database exposes the entire database with near certainty. How accurately is too accurately? Omega root n, and in this audience, I don't have to translate that. It basically means noise on the order of the square root of the population. That was a bombshell whose waves are just now reaching statistical agencies. I've given versions of this talk since I arrived at the Census Bureau in late 2016. Usually the audience is other official statisticians or groups of social scientists who have never heard of these results. I'm going to show you why the way we published the 2010 Census of Population and Housing, that's the last one we did, and the one before that, the 2000, and the one before that, the 1990, is vulnerable to a database reconstruction attack. To do that, I have to give you some numbers which are embarrassingly small compared to the numbers that uh, Joseph showed you in the first talk of this session, but they're the numbers that matter here. In 2010, we said that the population of the United States was, I'm gonna read it all the way out, 308,745,538, consisting of 300,000, 300 million, excuse me, 758,215 people who lived in households regular residential domiciles, 7,987,323 who lived in what we call group quarters, uh, collections of unrelated individuals, and 116,716,292 persons who were declared the head of their household. That's the person who filled out the form as person one and then filled in the data for the rest of the people who live there. Why did I give you those numbers all the way to the unit? Because they are an exact calculation from our confidential database. That's exactly the number of person records in the person table. That's exactly a number of person records in the person table that we say live in households, exactly the number of person records in the person table that we say live in group quarters, and exactly the number of persons in the person table who claim to be person one, or the head of household. And that means the housing unit is occupied, okay? All exact. That's just four numbers, all right? But when we publish data in support of redistricting, 
We published data on, in 2010, 10,600,000 odd habitable blocks. A block is the smallest geographic unit that you can resolve census data to. It's a hierarchy. That hierarchy aggregates up to habitable tracts. That's a larger unit. There's about 50 people in an average block. There's about 4,000 people in an average tract. We published the data on their sex, their age, in 115 categories. It's by year out to 110 plus. Uh, for purposes of enforcing the Voting Rights Act, which was passed in 1965, oh, I lost my screen, uh, but I think I've memorized this. We published 126 different categories of race, race and ethnicity combinations and 17 relationships of every person to the uh, head of household. Step back a little bit. All right. If you're used to creating contingency tables, uh, some of you would call them histograms or simple count datas, data. If I multiply out all those things, at the national level, there's a contingency table of about 500,000 cells, only 30% of which are occupied at the national level. So that's a very sparse table, even at the national level. And we've never actually published that table at the national level. All right, what do we actually publish? Uh, I can't see them, but you can see them behind me. We publish about 8 billion statistics from that database, or roughly 25 statistics per person. That is why it's possible to conceive of a vulnerability in the database reconstruction arena that uh, uh, Diner and Nassim anticipated. All right. In fact, the database reconstruction theorem is the death knell for traditional methods of publishing data from confidential databases. And that sentence doesn't apply just to the US Census Bureau. That sentence applies to any agency that tabulates data from confidential inputs. You need to pay attention to what the cryptographers have taught us about how to protect confidentiality when you publish data. All right. So what we did was a series of internal experiments. And what did they do? First, they confirmed that you could reproduce the confidential data file, the, so in technical terms, the person table from the confidential data file, very accurately by using the statistics that I just showed you a summary of in combination with the known uh, statisticians call it sample base, you would call it database sch sample scheme, you would call it the database schema. You can reconstruct. Now, you can only reconstruct the variables that you actually tabulate. We didn't tabulate name, we didn't tabulate address, so you can't reconstruct the people who live in these households by name and address, but you can construct an image of their record. And uh, that is considered a serious confidentiality problem within the Census Bureau. Indeed, we had it on our enterprise risk register. If you know anything about how risks are managed in the federal government, that means that uh, you're being uh, watched for how you manage this risk. And we had to elevate it to an issue. An issue is a risk with probability one. So that means we are actively managing the consequences of database reconstruction. The vulnerability is on reconstruction. The vulnerability is not on re-identification. Re-identification is what is a violation of the statutory protection of confidentiality in the underlying database. Right? But re reconstruction can abet re-identification, and we're testing now the extent to which the reconstruction abets re-identification. This was the strong motivation for moving to formally private systems for the 2020 census, and in particular, uh, full-on differential privacy. Okay, so I'm going to show you how we put together the reconstruction equation system, all right? We didn't harvest all 8 billion statistics. We harvested about 5 billion statistics specifically from the person table. In, in official statistic terms, that's universe, all, all persons, okay? First from the publication in 2010, that supported the redistricting uh, efforts in 2010, which has the technical name PL94-171, all right? And it had tables that look like this, tables of whether you're Hispanic or not, and then uh, whether you are in one of the um, 63 race and ethnicity categories that the Office of Management and Budget instructs us to use for the purposes of um, producing redistricting data, all 
right? There's a more detailed one, and this is for voting age per persons, Hispanic, crossed by uh, those um, ethnicity categories. Then we moved to the general summary of the 2010 census, which is called, in technical terms, Summary File 1. It's a very creative name, all right? And so that has a, a table that shows the, the population in every block. More importantly, it also has a table that shows you how many people multi-coded the different races, because you can declare as many as you want. Right. And it has a detailed table of sex by age by all those race and ethnicity categories at the block level and an even more detailed one at the tract level. We harvested all those statistics. All right. So at the tract or block level, the sample space is about 29,000 cells, the vast majority of which are empty for any uh, cell, for any tract or block. Every time you encounter a zero in that table, you can strike records from the, from the uh, database schema or from the sample space. And so it allows you to create linear equations that relate the eligible records in the database to the sample statistics. You have to include the zeros, though, because you have to get rid of the ones that you don't never, ever need to tabulate in that tractor block. All right. So this is exactly the reconstruction equations from the original Diner and Nassim uh, article for exact statistics. That system cannot be overdetermined. That because those tables all came from a real person table. All right, so that means there does exist a solution. Usually it's underdetermined. There are many solutions. But many of those solutions, and in some cases all of the solutions, have certain features, as I think that's your language, variables in my language, that are the same on all the reconstructed records. So there's no error in that part of the reconstruction. Right. We will release full details on this this fall. So that led us to adopt formal privacy. Actually, we adopted formal privacy on my speculation that that was going to be the case. All right. Now that, of course, means we go back to the 2006 paper, uh, Dwork, McSherry, Nassim, and, and Smith, uh, the original differential privacy publication. I'm not going to do the technical details of differential privacy. Uh, there are experts in the audience, and I'm sure we can talk about that if there are questions. All right. Here's how we actually did it. All right. So that we created what is known in uh, statistical agencies as a disclosure limitation or a disclosure avoidance system. Adopting differential privacy, I'll give you a few more technical details on the next slide, because if you can string together a series of differentially private algorithms, they're closed under composition, so you know how to compute the overall privacy loss budget. The guarantees are robust to post-processing. After you release the data, the privacy guarantees can't be corrupted by whatever people do to the data you release. You can release it and forget, that you forget about it. It's future-proof. Future publications of data and future technology don't degrade the privacy protection. The privacy parameters are provable and tunable, and they have not been engineered into the system. They're all engineered as levers. In principle, the privacy guarantees are explainable. They're certainly public. All of our algorithms and the code we use to implement them and the parameters will be published. And this provides strong protection against database reconstruction attacks, which will therefore greatly control the risk of re-identification attacks on the 2020 census. The disadvantage is that you have to engineer a system that gives you fitness for use, suitable accuracy, and such systems require that we process the entire country at once. You know, for, from the point of view of your perspective, that's not such a huge calculation, but inside the federal government, that is a monumental calculation. Uh, NOAA could do it because someone built a system for NOAA that can ingest this kind of data and do the calculations at this scale. We had to build the system that could do the calculations at this scale. And it's not like it was a hard thing to do. Conceptually, it was a hard thing to do within the constraints of a federal IT system, all right? And, and this is the big internal change inside the Census Bureau, every single use of the confidential data has to be accounted for in the privacy loss budget. So all around the Bureau, we had to identify branches that had direct access to the confidential table and control what they could calculate from it as well. That has been a much bigger problem, a uh, challenge. All right, so here's some extra technical details for those who, uh, who know a lot about this. It's a central differential privacy system, so we're the curators of the confidential data. It has a controlled total privacy loss budget, which I'll explain to you uh, in the next couple slides. 
The relevant definition of epsilon differential privacy here is bounded epsilon differential privacy. The, we operate as if the total population of the US is known or public. The semantic guarantee is therefore uh, minus two epsilon to, to plus two epsilon, where epsilon is the total privacy loss budget. The rest of the semantic guarantees having to do with other constraints that came from the confidential data that were implemented in the production system, we will publish when we publish the algorithms. All of this will be published at the end of the test, which is running now, the 2018 end-to-end -end census test. Uh, it has a sample publication component. When those sample publications are published, these algorithms and all of the associated theory and code and parameter values will also be published. All right. So here's how we did it on the 2020 census. All right. We had to implement what is conceptually a top-down algorithm. I'll say this on the first slide. It's not actually implemented top-down. All of the differentially private measurements of the confidential data are taken at once, and the, pri the total privacy loss budget is doled out to the different stages at the beginning, so there's no return to the confidential data once we turn on the algorithm. However, solving the system required a sequence of calls to uh, um, an, uh, an optimizer, an equation solver, really. And that optimizer has to be fed the data in the correct sequence. It has to be fed the data from the top down. Uh, and just for what it's worth, only the Garobi optimizer could handle the problem. All right. So we start by that 500,000 cell national table. We fit that with differential privacy. And then, conceptually, we generate approximately 330 million microdata records that correspond to the images in that table. All right. So now we have an estimate of sex, raisinous manity, hispanicity, relation to the householder, and age that we need to attach the geographic identifiers to. So the next step is to go to the state level, and using the differentially private measurements at the state level, fit the best fitting allocation of those microdata records to the 51 states. Well, there's 50 states on, the, on the Washington, D.C. I live in Washington, D.C. We don't get to elect a person to the House of Representatives. We have no senators. But mercifully, the, an amendment to the Constitution gives us three electoral votes, and so we are included in this reapportionment calculation. All right. So now when this step is done, we have the same 330 million records. Now they have a state ID on them, the best fitting state ID. Then you go down through the geographic hierarchy. The, the lowest political level is a county. In some parts of the country, that's called a parish. In other parts of the country, it's, it's, uh, it's a different um, sub-state geographic political definition. But there's a county or county equivalents. So now we have the 330 million records, and they have national, state, and county level geography. Now we go into our publication geography hierarchy, do the same thing for the track level, and finally, to those, there will be about 8 million of these blocks in 2020, to those 20 million blocks. So when we're done now at this stage, we have 330 million synthetic microdata records that are all post-processing of a differentially private input, so they inherit by composition the privacy loss budget that was assigned to this whole operation. We know the total privacy loss expenditure. All right. So those 330 million records are fed to our tabulation system. I'll spare you having to ask me the question, we can't feed our tabulation system a set of tables that it aggregates. It can only build the tables from microdata, so it has to be fed the synthetic microdata that have been passed through the differential privacy filter. All right. We then issue a certificate that says that the operation passed all of its uh, um, component tests and that the total privacy loss budget for this particular microdata file was um, epsilon, and that includes an estimate, epsilon A, that was allocated to estimating the accuracy from that table. All right. So what are the operational decisions in doing this? Well, somebody's got to set the privacy loss budget. And the engineers from day one have been told they may not hardwire the privacy loss parameters, they may not hardwire the allocation of the privacy loss to the different components of the algorithm. That all has to be programmable. They may not hardwire the allocation of privacy loss to the redistricting data versus the other summary data. That's going to be done by my colleagues, the senior executive staff of the Census Bureau, 
uh, known collectively in this case as the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee. And we have been teaching them how to think about this problem. So now I'll show you the methods that we're using to think about this problem. All right. So first, what do these privacy loss accuracy curves look like? As a part of our development system, we have built an instance of the 1940 census data in the United States. The census data are released after 72 years. So the 1940 census is public and um, it's curated by the Minnesota Population Center. We've taken the 100% enumeration data from the 1940 census and built these privacy loss models uh, using the same algorithms as we're using for 2010. So I can show these to you because they're calculated on public data. And when you get our algorithms, you can run them on these data to see for yourself how they behave. All right. So the key thing to notice is in all these figures, the blue line is the top-down algorithm. So on the horizontal axis is the privacy loss budget, epsilon. On the vertical axis is my preferred measure of accuracy for this particular implementation, which is one minus the total variation distance. So the total variation di distance is one half the L1 loss divided by the size of the population in that particular table. Right. What you can see is that the accuracy for the national, state, and county data is close to one for all levels of epsilon. And that shouldn't surprise you. Those are fairly large political organizations. An enumeration district is not a tract. It's a little bit smaller. It's not a block. It's a little bit bigger. There's about um, 1,000, 1,500 people in an enumeration district. So it's like a block group in the current census uh, um, hierarchy. What you can see is that the, the blue line shows that the accuracy of the top-down algorithm is pretty good at the enumeration district level, but it's certainly not perfect. However, the use case for these data is not that the enumeration district, or in modern terms, the block, be accurate. It is that geographic aggregates from those block level data be aggregate. And those geographic aggregates look more like counties than, um, than they do enumeration districts. So these data actually satisfy the fitness for use for redistricting. What's the black line? If you naively apply differential privacy with the same privacy loss budget to the lowest level of geography that you intend to publish and then aggregate up, that's the black line. We call it bottom up. I didn't show you a description of the algorithm. It's very similar to the algorithms that have been implemented in the Chrome browser and uh, uh, iOS 10 and 11 so, so, and, and Windows 10. So you can think of that as the, uh, as the local differential privacy alternative, although it's better than local differential privacy because some of the central advantages accrue to those lowest levels of geography. All right. So how do you manage this trade-off? So uh, my colleague uh, Ian Schmutty at, at Georgia and I have recently published a paper in the American Economic Review, which is about how to manage the trade-off. It's about telling the difference between the technology, all the stuff we've been talking about until now, and the choice set, which is how to balance the social need for accuracy against the social need for privacy protection. Right? So if you want to think about this as a social choice problem, you're going to have to take off your computer science hat and put on my economics hat because the engine for thinking about social choice problems requires the definition of a social welfare function. So we have to be able to calculate the marginal social benefit. We have to be able to calculate how much all persons in the United States are willing to pay for data accuracy in terms of foregone privacy. Uh, nothing in a differentially private calculation gives you any indication of that preference. What the data privacy calculations give you is what economists call the marginal rate of transformation, the slope of the trade-off between accuracy and privacy loss when you do the calculation to compute your differentially private uh, estimates. All right. This is the same problem that Google has in rapport, that Apple has in iOS 11, that Microsoft has in Windows 10 telemetry. How do you choose the epsilon and accept the accuracy level that it will give you? All right. so, what you do is you take those same graphs we've been looking at, and in this case, that's the red line. That's an estimated production technology. That's what a differentially private top-down algorithm looks like for some uh, stylized population, okay? Its slope measures the marginal social cost of additional accuracy in foregone privacy loss. The straight line, the simplest indifference curves from a social welfare function are straight lines. The straight line is the marginal social benefit curve. How does society trade off accuracy versus privacy loss for this particular problem? That particular one was estimated from, um, 
from survey data on how important federal statistics are for resource allocation and how important confidentiality protection is. That might not be the best source of data, but at the moment it's the only source of data that directly asks questions like that. I got to tell you that for the problem that we're talking about, supplying data to redraw every legislative district in the country, it's a much more challenging problem to model the social preferences for data accuracy. How accurate do those districts and how accurate does that Voting Rights Act enforcement have to be versus the privacy protection of the people who live in those small geographic areas that are getting aggregated. All right. This is a hard problem because there isn't any real statutory guidance. The Supreme Court has said one person, one vote, so legislative districts have to be approximately the same size. The Supreme Court has said that we may only use sampling at the sub-state level, but it hasn't said whether disclosure limitation is sampling or an, an acceptable statistical method. Other statistical methods are allowed. Sampling is the method that's not allowed. This isn't sampling by most statisticians' definition of sampling, but the court hasn't really ever considered whether disclosure limitation is a form of prohibited sampling. The Voting Rights Act requires the creation of minority-majority districts. Um, those require accurate uh, race and ethnicity data and accurate data on uh, eligible voters. The privacy interest here is based on the Title 13 requirement that you not be able to re-identify the respondents in the published data. Right. We are asking for help from the user community in addressing this issue. That Federal Register notice asks all the users of the 2010 census data, tell us exactly how you used it, tell us the geography level that went into your calculations, and show us your use case. No use case, no data. I've already made that very clear inside uh, the Census Bureau. You have to produce a use case so we know how to tune the accuracy for a particular calculation. All right. So the job of the engineers in this world is to get a production possibility frontier. That's what economists call them. If you're a statistician, it looks like a receiver operating characteristics curve. To get that thing as close to the one, to the zero one point, the uh, northwest corner as possible. And our current algorithms, as you can see from this chart, dominate uh, naive methods that just use central differential privacy at the lowest level of geography, and they dominate the method that's been engineered into Rapport, iOS 11, and Windows 10. Right. So we have better accuracy at every level of Epsilon. But computer scientists think the social optimum is down in the region where Epsilon is below two. And when you extract the preferences of social scientists, and you might just well include national statisticians in that category, they operate up there where the accuracy is above 0.9. So we got a problem in that we can't simultaneously at the moment meet those two uh, representations of social welfare and nothing in the technology tells you how to make that choice. So for the redistricting problem, if you think the right choice favors accuracy, you might set the uh, privacy loss budget at about three and a half and get accuracy of 94%. If you think that the social welfare function is more privacy favoring, you might set the privacy loss budget at one and take accuracy of 60%. That clearly has lots of ramifications and working all those through is the job of the Decision makers, not the job of the engineers. All right. I promised some people, primarily Ilya, that I would also include references to tutorials that have been developed that try to explain this to practitioners. So the first one was developed by uh, Ashwin Machanavahala and his colleagues, and the second one was developed by the Harvard Data Privacy Tools. And I draw your particular attention to Nassim and Wood, where they actually talk about legal interpretations of differential privacy. All right. It's time for questions. Thank you all very much.